All right, hey guys, uh, we're gonna do something a little different on this video. Uh, much like the last video, Connor did his whole thing with uh, his whole separate video. And with this one, I'm gonna do mine. Um, so separately, what I've been doing every year is I do a top 10 list uh, of all the movies that I see in that year. Uh, it's just kind of been my thing for the past few years. So that's what I'm gonna do here. I'm just gonna kind of do it in our video format. Um, so these are just the movies that I've seen in 2020. And I think everybody can agree with this one that it's just kind of been a shit year all around. Uh, so for me, usually I average about 50 to 60 movies a year. This one was 34. So making a top 10 out of these movies were uh, hard to say the least, I guess. And it was I really had to bust out at the end of the year and just watch a lot of them that I missed. Um, so yeah, I'll just get right into it because I don't want to keep you waiting any longer. But yeah, the so from our top 10, my number 10 starting off, uh, is one I just had to put on the list, uh, and that's Tenet, the uh, more recent Christopher Nolan movie. Um, and the reason I was tiptoeing with this one was because I'm a huge fan of Christopher Nolan. I think he does amazing movies like Dark Knight, Inception, Interstellar. All those movies are fantastic to me. Um, but Tenet was weird, and when it came out, I was super pumped for it. But I knew going into it I was going to be confused as fuck. And so when I went into it, cleared my head. Um, ultimately, even though I sat up in that theater, was trying to pay attention, it confused the shit out of me until after I did my own research on the movie. And uh, for those who aren't aware of it, it's, it introduces kind of a uh, idea of time inversion. Not necessarily time travel or anything like that, but just looping time backward. And co you know, coincidentally enough, the part that confused me wasn't even that. Um, that part you kind of grasped very quickly. The thing that's confusing is his entire world building and his character arcs. That can be the toughest part to grasp in this movie. Regardless, I had to put it on the list because ultimately this movie was beautiful. It looked fantastic. Christopher Nolan always does unique ideas for every movie. He, every movie he does, he always tries to show you something that you're, I guess, not used to seeing in the theater. You have to walk out with something like, oh, that's something new. Whether you liked it or didn't like it, because this one was definitely 50-50 down the board. Um, ultimately, I think it still gave me a sense of enjoyment, like something I was used to seeing when I was a kid going to the movies and seeing all these huge you know, blockbusters. And this one still left a place in my heart. Um, sound mixing this movie wasn't the greatest. It sounded like a lot of ambiance noise in the background. Um, but he's very notorious for doing that even. Um, until the movie finally officially comes out on Blu-ray. Um, but ultimately, I still love this movie. I know a lot of people didn't. Um, but this movie had to make my list. Again, it was very tough top ten. If I had a lot more movies this year, maybe it wouldn't have even made it. But uh, yeah, that one makes it. Coming in at number nine, we got a movie that I actually watched recently that came out on Hulu. Um, and it's the Andy Samberg movie called Palm Springs. Um, I didn't know anything about this one either because it kind of just kinda showed up on our feed um essentially it's just groundhog day but getting stuck in a loop and not and just kind of accepting life as is it's you know it's all about andy samberg and then krista malati who end up going to this um wedding and, and while there they find herself into a cave or she finds herself into this cave that sucks her in and she finds herself replaying the uh, the entire day over again, finding out that he has been doing it for so long anyway, and he's kind of just accept life. And the whole the whole message of the movie is just trying to not accept life and to just take chances and go forward. And even though that um, you get the goofy atmosphere, I'm a huge fan of Andy Samberg. I think Connor and I, uh, I I'm pretty sure me and Connor, have, you know, I've talked about him before too. But he's I'm a huge fan of him. If anybody's ever seen it, Brooklyn Nine Nine or any movie with that he's done with like Adam Sandler or anything with Lonely Island, I think he's incredibly talented, and he's just the same goofy character in this one. But ultimately, I ha I had to you know I had to watch this one because you know I, I can't not watch anything, even if it's a shit movie. I'm gonna find a reason to love it just because of Andy Samberg. And I just love his humor. Coming in at number eight, we got The Invisible Man. Um, this one, I'll be honest, I thought when it came out, it was gonna be it was gonna be shit because um, when you know. Uh, I think it's Paramount. I can't remember. I think it is Paramount, the ones that got the rights to all these movie monsters, quote unquote, where they got, you know, Frankenstein and everything like that. And ultimately, I never, you know, classified the Invisible Man as a monster per se, but they got the rights to this one. And I expected them to go down that route of 
making this some kind of cheesy shit horror movie because uh, it came out in the beginning of the year. So, um, but when I watched it, um, I was just blown away. I didn't expect it to be as good as it was. Elizabeth Moss leads it um, as the main uh, woman in it that is getting abused by her uh, ex, whom she leaves and finds herself being stalked by this just invisible force, not knowing if it's an entity or a ghost or what it is, but she's just being stalked by that. And people are seeing her as crazy. Um, I think this movie had some of the better suspense jump uh, scenes that I've ever had. I ultimately didn't expect any of the scenes to happen. They kind of just strike you when you're least expecting it. Whereas a lot of horror movies now have been doing it where you, you see the same fucking trope. You'll see somebody look into a mirror and then hear something behind them. And then, oh, then the mirror just happens to be, or it's like a mirror on a cabinet just happens to be halfway open. So when she closes it, the mirror will show you like a fucking person behind them. And that trope just gets overused like crazy or they'll fake a jump scare and then go straight into scaring you when you think you least expect it. But it's just become so overused now that it just drives me insane. Um, but this movie does it in just the most unexpected spots and not cheap either. They're all done really well. I think the acting is fantastic in this movie. Um, and overall, I I was really, really impressed with this movie and uh, I definitely had to put it in the top ten. Um, so coming in at number seven was another early movie this year um, that I was pumped for going into and just came out in love with it just as much. Um, but it's the Guy Ritchie movie, The Gentleman. Um, which has a crazy cast is from Matthew McConaughey um, and Charlie Hunnam from Sons of Anarchy, Colin Farrell, Hugh Grant even. Um, so many people in this film and... I'm a I'm a huge fan of uh, Guy Ritchie movies too. I'm I know he's had some duds here and there. I know Aladdin was dog shit, uh, but I mean ultimately I think he was just put on a leash for that one, so he didn't get to explore his thing. Um, but this type of movie, this kind of mobster, gangster kind of thing, I think is kind of his bread and butter. Um, this is you know it's all in uh, it's all in just kind of a Britain world and everything like that, and there's so many different personalities and quick snappy dialogue that just makes it so funny um and obviously and honestly the the surprising thing to me in this movie my i think my one of my favorite characters was hugh grant i think this is possibly hugh grant's best movie i know he's really known for you know back in the day doing a lot of the romance movies and this man was paddington and uh in this one he's saying the word cunt like five times in a row over and over again in every sentence so it's just kind of a different uh feel on this on this guy um, and like I said, the snappy dialogue makes it humorous. You got kind of alpha males in this movie that just kind of butt heads with each other, and it's that creates kind of a uh, a comedic kind of feel on it. Even though it's got a lot of intense moments, a lot of jarring moments where you're not really sure what's going on because there's stories being told and they're on purpose being told in the wrong way, just kind of uh, distract the viewer and to distract the characters in the movie. But it uh, it creates like this sense of what's actually going on, and I think that was what made it such a good movie in my mind. All right, so coming in at number six, um, I really wanted to put this one at seven just because it has seven in the title, but I didn't want to be a five-year-old anymore. So this one is The Trial of the Chicago 7, um, which came out on Netflix uh, earlier this uh, summer, I believe. Uh, but this one just goes over everything over the Chicago riots that uh, happened over, uh, ha happened obviously in Chicago, but it was uh, all about the Vietnam War. For people that weren't aware, people were pretty pissed at our entire country for sending troops over to Vietnam, a lot of kids that were dying. And this shows the story of a lot of the protesters, a lot of the people that came out, people that led this protest group that came out and um, shit went south with these riots and these, pro and these protests and everything like that. And this doesn't showcase a lot of that. This kind of shows the trial after the court hearings that take days and days. Um, Surprisingly, though, this one has a lot of comedic moments in it as well. As dark as it is, um, there is a judge in this movie who is one of the most vile characters that I think has been on TV in a long time. Um, you know, it just shows our, you know, systematic racism that we had back in the day. It shows a lot of the stuff that we had back um, during the riots had a lot of that. Um, this one also had Sasha Baron Cohen in it as well, who was, I think, the show stealer for sure. He was, he was a minor character in this one. 
Um, no, not minor. He's just one of the side characters. Like I said, there's seven of them in this one. The Trial of Chicago 7. So he's one of the smaller characters as opposed to the rest of them, and he ends up stealing a lot of it due to his comedic relief. It's him and Jeremy Strong who play these hippies, and they lead this hippie group. Um, and he ends up playing Abby Hoffman, who was an author, and every, or was an author before, unfortunately, committing suicide. But he was... Um, he was fantastic in this one. He's such a smart ass to the judge. He was smart ass to everything and just ran it in kind of a non serious way unless he had to be. And I think that light tone really helped calm this one down, considering this is a pretty heavy movie, pretty shocking movie with everything that happens with it. I was sitting there in disbelief. Um, it is really good. I, 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 I really suggest people watch this just, just to see because this trial doesn't get talked about at all. I mean, I didn't really know much about it either. I knew about the riots, but this is. A pretty important movie, I would say, just in how uh, relatable it is. It is, and unfortunately, in 2020, what it was. Um, so, this one is incredible. I definitely suggest people watch it. All right, so now we're getting down to the top five, and this one was definitely the hardest. Every time I make this list, I always compile a bunch of them, and ends up being like 20 or so. It was hard to me to get 10 a- enough, but to narrow it down to the top five was was really really hard. And um, much as I love this next movie, I, I couldn't put it any higher just because the next one's following it. I thought were fantastic. But number five, I have Soul, the new Disney Pixar movie that came out on Christmas. Um, I was pumped going into this one because this one definitely looked like a different type of uh, Pixar movie. I was, I'm a huge fan of Pixar. I love everything they've done, everything from The Incredibles, Toy Story, you name it. I love everything they do. I don't think they really miss the mark too much. Um, at least off the top of my head, I don't see one. But this one came out and... Um, I've heard from a lot of people they didn't expect it to be about a guy dying and his soul going to the afterlife, essentially. And he's just learning to grasp and uh, and grasp with what he is now and to accept life and to accept the loss of life, even though he had a lot of things he was trying to accomplish. Um, I thought this was fantastic. I know uh, the crew was great. You have Jamie Foxx and Tina Fey that lead it. Um, and Jamie Foxx, another character or another actor that I will watch anything that man's in just because I think he's an incredible actor as well. Um, but he did a fantastic job in this one too. I think this, this movie is not necessarily the one that's going to make you cry. I don't think, but it is going to make you appreciate life, which is what I did when I came out of it. I was sitting there just kind of baffled with it. It is the most beautiful looking Pixar movie. It looks so realistic. Um, but at the same time, this one made me feel more about my life and you got to, and it, it really showcases where you are, what you can be, and what you're not doing, and not wasting life, essentially. Just being able to take things not for granted and just uh, fucking move with yourself and just do things that are happy for you, do things that are going to make you, you know, exceptional. Just anything like that. And I think this movie is fantastic at it. Like I said, I don't think it's going to be the one to make you cry. Um, it might. You know, everybody cries at certain, certain things. Everybody gets emotional at certain things. But unfortunately, I, I, you know, I didn't cry in this one, but it is a very powerful movie nonetheless. All right, coming in at number four, I got a movie that I did not even hear anything about. We, Me and Anna were going through and trying to find a movie. Um, we went through Amazon Prime and found Let Him Go with uh, Kevin Costner and Diane Lane. Um, this one was just a surprise. I didn't expect this one to be good. I didn't know anything about it and hear anything about it. No trailer or nothing. Um, and this one is ultimately just about two grandparents um who when their son dies their his their son's widow and their grandchild marry this new man and he's an abusive guy and i don't want to say too much because it kind of gives a lot of it away but he takes them away to his family it's all about them rushing out there to get him back in some way they don't want this family they don't want her and they don't want this child to be in this abusive um, household it is very action-packed um very intense this is probably one of the most heavy movies I watched this year in terms of gut wrenching because it it leaves you in suspense quite a bit. I was caught in this movie having to pause it a couple times because I was holding my breath, not knowing what was going to happen. It was all during dialogue, all during talks that say the grandparents would have with you know his family. In this movie, yeah, we had to pause it because we were we were too stressed out. We had to take a walk and come back halfway through. Um, if a movie can do that to me, then it immediately for me, I knew that it had to make my top 10. Um, and one thing I noticed in this movie that I forgot all about, but I loved, uh, Kevin Costner and Diane Lane, who lead this, they play the grandparents. Um, they are the same people 
that uh, play in Man of Steel and play Superman's parents. So there's that little fun little fact trivia for you. Um, both of them are married in this one again, and I, I think they both have incredible chemistry. I think they're fantastic. They play these two country, you know, folks out in the in the middle of the wilderness in Montana that just know how to shoot guns, know how to ride horses, and it doesn't feel like actors that are just great, trying to learn this for the role. It feels like these are really them when they're not filming fucking movies. Um, and I just love that, and I love seeing that kind of thing. So, yeah, Let Him Go was a fantastic movie. Had to make top ten. Um, I suggest people go check it out. It's on Amazon Prime, uh, and you can rent that one. And you know, in a time in 2020 right now, I think that's a good thing to support the arts because we theaters have been shut down for too long. Coming in at number three, we got another movie that we found um, coincidentally on Hulu, and it is Run with uh, Sarah Paulson from uh, All the American Horror Story uh, seasons. Um, this one is, if anybody is aware of the D.D. and Gypsy Blanchard case that happened, I think it was early 2000s. They even made a um, show about that, and that's on Hulu, too, called The Act. It's essentially the same thing. This has just kind of got a different take on it and different different suspense moments, different um, oh, shit moments. Uh, it's essentially just a, um, a mom with her daughter that she takes care of. She has all these different problems. She's paralyzed. She's asthmatic, diabetic, you name it. She's got all these problems. Um, and the mom has gotten so used to taking care of her and keeping her isolated from the world to the point where she's keeping her on purpose isolated from everything, away from fears and everything like this. And it's a scary concept because it can happen and has happened. And it creates kind of this fear of, oh, shit, what is she hiding from me? Um, what is she What is she giving me? What medicine am I getting? Which is a uh, big part of this movie. What am I getting? Is, is any of this even real? Am I even paralyzed? That whole, that whole wonder, that whole fear... Um, and the fact of knowing that this has actually happened uh, makes this one extremely intense. And I will say, this is probably one of the most satisfying endings I've ever seen in a movie in a long time. Um, doesn't make you, it, you don't think it's going a certain way that it does, and it just, it shocked me. And I was like, and I jumped up in the air watching this movie and said, fuck, yeah. And I just, <laughs> me and Anna, I'm telling you, this was, this was an incredible one. I think it's so, so good. Um, Sarah Paulson, I think, is the best I've ever seen her in. I've watched the American Horror Stories, fell off of them. I guess they really weren't for me. Um, and I don't really know much else she's been in besides that. Um, and, like, Glass. I know she was in Glass, like, as a smaller role. But she's – I've taken a whole new step with her. She's creepy as fuck in this movie, and she's incredible, I think. Uh, and the one that plays her daughter, I, I don't know her name. She's I think she's a breakout actress, too. I think after this movie, she'll land a lot more roles, and we'll be seeing her a lot more um, as well. So, coming in at number two, uh, this one was tough, too. Number one and two were extremely tough because I didn't know which one I wanted to put in the top spot. Um, and the reason I put this one at number two, ultimately, is just a really, really dark movie. And that is The Devil All the Time. The Devil All the Time, starring Tom Holland, um, Robert Pattinson. You know, you got a whole, this another one has a huge cast. Robert Pattinson, Sebastian Stan, Jason Clark, um, so many people. Um, even uh, Pennywise is in there, uh, the Skarsgård kid. I, I don't know which one it is. There's like 30 of them. But um, this one's incredible. And like I said, I didn't put this one at number one simply because of the dark tone. The rewatchability on it is there, um, but it is extremely fucking dark. I don't necessarily have fun watching it, but I love watching it just for the talent and the, and the, and the um, intense risks that it takes. It, it takes a lot of risks that you don't expect. And shit, it's just like, it's definitely a like dark tone it's just too it's too heavy i don't think kids will ever want to watch this one <laughs> but uh tom holland i think is an incredible actor i think it's he's been very popularly obviously being cast as spider-man um coming on doing all those movies and onward even he's he's landing a lot more roles and this is a more adult movie for him and i think this is probably his best thing he's done he, de he you know he plays a backwoods kid just trying to make his way out there and it's hard to talk about this one without spoiling what it is um because if i talk about anything it spoils anything like everything about this movie can be spoiled by one concept how i'll do it is i'll just say that it is about like three to four storylines that intertwine in this backwoods country uh between a pastor uh, a couple that are on the road just road tripping um and then him and, I, and sebastian stan who plays the cop all of them intertwine in a pretty vast 
vast convoluted way and it's extremely extremely heavy as i said so if uh, you get the chance to watch this one this one is on netflix the devil of time is fantastic um i'd say you know be prepared like i said it is a gut punch and it is incredibly incredibly dark uh, so you're not looking for a family night movie with this one um and then my number one movie of 2020 um came out on amazon prime and that is the vast of night Connor, I think that this one is more your speed as well, if you ever get the chance to check this one out. It is um, essentially a 1950s UFO, alien kind of story. Um, and it takes it back to a, you know, a very tiny, tiny, uh, tiny, tiny uh, town that just happens to be the hot spot for UFOs. And yes, it is in Nevada. So it makes, that's, that's what they're using. It's like kind of this old twilight zone trope um but it works so well um i did some research on it because i was very impressed with it it is a small budget movie it was made for seven hundred fifty thousand dollars, um and ended up grossing a lot more than that. i don't know what the exact thing is with it but the director saved all this money himself um i believe he was working basketball games he photography or did something but he just saved up all this money and shot this movie himself he got a whole crew to do it he had the whole crew just pitch on ideas how we're going to shoot this shot um this this one this movie has a lot of one takes in it like a lot of one shots is shots of one of the actresses in it at a switchboard for nine minutes she's the switchboard is sitting there or the take is on her at the switchboard for nine minutes and for me it was still enticing i think it worked it was fantastic um even the the setting and the place was amazing it's just a tiny town and they really utilize it and show it to you you know it's not a green screen you know it's not um small sound stage or anything like that this is really a town that they filmed at um, he used two hundred thousand dollars to sand down a basketball court uh strip away the three-point line strip away the volleyball lines and make it look like it would in the 50s and i, I just the attention to detail in this movie is amazing the dialogue is incredible i'm a huge quentin tarantino fan who is huge on dialogue and this one has a lot of snappy dialogue a lot of and like i said it's one take so this is all rehearsed choreographed dialogue if you fuck up they're going to have to restart it or figure a way around it. It is one of those. And I do like this, the whole alien thing. Watching this takes me back to um, like movies like The Fourth Kind and stuff like that where you are seeing you know, these stories being told to you and it just sends chills down your spine because you don't know. Are there you know, alien beings up there? Are there UFOs flying around? And it's just like the, the old shit I used to do as a kid, just researching this stuff. It's like, oh shit, there's this sighting here. There's this sighting here. I wonder if this shit's real or is it faked? What is it? Um, and I will say this one doesn't show any aliens. Um, that, that doesn't mean anything, though, considering the fact that a lot of the alien movies that are really good don't show them to you. Um, or if they do, it's very quick, quick, quick thing because it wants to keep that sense of illusion. Are they real kind of thing? Um, and I like that about it. I think the stories in this that are told by some of the characters are intense. They had chills just up i had goosebumps this entire movie here and stuff like this um and it is i'm i, I had to put it at number one because i'm a fan of this genre i'm a fan of um one shot takes in general a movie that can do it is impressive to me and i'm a fan of the small budget and this uh first time director um raising this money himself his name's andrew patterson but he's uh raising this money himself shot it and i think because of this movie he's going to be getting a lot more um praise and a lot more money for budgets to make hopefully more of this genre or um, intense Twilight Zone-esque dramas. I think this one's really good if you had the chance. It's on Amazon Prime for free. It's no charge if you have Amazon Prime. Um, and yeah, I think that's top one you should check out out of my entire list. And I don't think some people will like it because it is it is kind of a slower thing. It's not action-packed. It's not aliens invading a town. It's the entire fear of the unknown of if there is something out there and if there is something up there in general. So, um, So there you have it. That is my top 10. I hope you uh, get a chance to check out any of these, if any of them sound enticing to you. Um, I usually have a more in-depth list. I have honorable mentions. I have all that stuff. But like I said, I watched 34 movies this year, 2020, um, which is really, 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 really light for me. And uh, I don't have the honorable mentions. I, I, there was not enough that I could go, yeah, that was fantastic. I'm going to put that in honorable mention. But it, it, this is just what it is. And this was hard making this list, but I, I'm glad you guys were able to stick around and hear this out. Um, and I appreciate you guys. Thank you.